Stage fright. Hi, welcome to The Wonders of Writing and Publishing, which is sponsored by the Wood Library, the Canandaigua Writers Group, and Flair, which is the Finger Lakes Authors and Readers Experience. So one of the things that we know collectively is that writing can feel like a very painfully solitary pastime. This can be a wildly confusing journey. We have words, we have stories to tell, but sometimes we need a little help getting them onto the page and out into the world. So our wonderful authors have gathered here with us tonight to help share what they've learned on the journey from I have an idea to look at my book. <laughs> so. I'm Brooke Baker, I am a freelance editor, I teach writing at Cuba College, and I'm a co-founding member of Flair, along with Lori Adams, and uh, I'll be your moderator this evening. So in order to keep the conversation flowing, I'm going to ask that we hold questions until the end. Um, so again, welcome to the wonders of writing and publishing, I'm going to pass the microphone down. We'll start with uh, Kate Collier. Can you tell us a little about? Hi. I'm Kate Collier, and I write under two names, C.T. Collier, my initials, for the um, traditional mysteries that are over there on the yellow table, and Catherine, C-A-T-H-R-Y-N, Collier, for the romances that are right next to it. That's great. Thank you. <laughs> Hello. I'm Lori Reedman. I live here in Canandaigua. And um, I believe that sharing our stories help us heal and own who we are. And so um, I had a career in public relations and marketing writing for 35 years. And I've now transitioned to writing for myself and creative writing and writing for my clients. I have a coaching business called BU Coaching. And I am soon to self-publish a memoir titled Diamonds in the Dirt Stories from Junk Dirt. I'm Lori Gifford Adams. I have the table here behind Brooke. I'm from the Finger Lakes originally. I lived in Connecticut for 28 years and then moved back here in 2011. Um, my writing journey started as, as a teacher in Connecticut with Finding Atticus, the first book, and from there it just really started rolling and taking off. And then a, f a few years ago, I kind of pulled Brooke in and said, Brooke, we need a another group in this area to promote Finger Lakes authors. And she came kicking and screaming. <laughs> we, now, we now have flair, and when I last looked at our roster, we had 49 people, I believe, on our roster for flair. So there are a lot of Finger Lakes authors out here um, looking to get attention from readers. Hi, I'm Nancy Lane. I'm the, the lone illustrator here. <laughs> So, um, I grew up in Webster and I live in Canandaigua now. I've been illustrating for 30 years and I've been illustrating books for 25 years. Currently working more toward fine art, but I'm in the, at the red table over there with many of my picture books and I still do illustrate book covers, so I'll be answering all your art questions. Hi. <clears throat> I'm Vivian Vanderveld, not Viva Vanderveld. I write for children, uh, from younger to, to older. Uh, in case you see me moving my legs a lot, it is because I am getting over knee replacement surgery, so it is exercising, not fidgeting. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I'm Marcy Deal. Uh, I have been a, I shouldn't say have been, I am, <laughs> a writer, um, editor, producer uh, for, well, okay, let's start at the beginning. In 1981, I started publishing essays in humor for the DNC Sunday Magazine. And um, went into writing features for magazines for many, many years, uh, nonfiction, but also essays. Um, I was uh, the associate editor for Canandaigua Magazine. If you ever saw that, it was really beautiful. 
uh, and we missed a lot. So I've written for all kinds of things for, um, for regional and national publications um, in golf, lifestyle, um, health and medicine, all kinds of different uh, nonfiction stories, obviously. And um, I have also published, and I've always written fiction since I was a little kid. Um, but in, in 2014, I published um, my first novel, What You Don't Know Now. So I'm the turquoise uh, and blue, uh, reminiscent of the uh, Aegean Sea and Sky. My novel is a coming of age historical novel set in 1967. Um, so I, and I also uh, started, I was the launch for uh, publishing a hybrid publisher called Merge. And um, I'm kind of a work in progress right now, another fiction. Thank you all very much. <clears throat> so the questions tonight are arranged in order of some general categories. Some of them will be for a specific member of our panel and others will be for the whole group. I want to start with the topic of motivation. And so my first question is for Lori Reedman. So I think for each of us, there comes a t this moment when we realize that we have a, a story to tell. So for you, what was the moment, what was the catalyst for finally sitting down and writing that first piece? Um, I think I've always been a storyteller. And actually, one of the themes in my memoir is the power of pretend. I think probably the moment that I started to tell my story was when my children were probably 10 years ago. Um, as I said, I had, was a, a writer for, for my business. I wrote ghost wrote stories for CEOs and placed them in business publications. So I did business writing for many decades. And about 10 years ago, I said, I think I want to do something for me. My kids were older. And so I decided to take a, a class at Writers and Books. Just the only class that would fit into my schedule was on Thursday nights, and it was a memoir class. Never intended to write anything like that, but I got myself in the car on Thursday nights and started writing for myself. And the more I re revealed about my own story, the more I remembered. <coughs> I had some trauma in my childhood, and what often happens when you have trauma is you block it out. So much of my memory was like a scratched record. The more I wrote stories, the more came back, and I got feedback from the class that it was helpful and interesting and sometimes funny, and so that really became the moment that I started to collect the stories, when I realized that sharing my story would heal myself and maybe help others. So Nancy, from an illustrator's perspective, what was the first moment when you could realize, when you realized you could create images to bring stories to life? Gosh, I, um, I was 11 or 12. I was a big reader, big library kid, and um, loved animals, so I decided I'm just going to write my own story. So I wrote poems. I think there were seven poems, each one about a different animal, and then I did full color watercolor illustrations where it was like that. So that's my, my book launch there. <laughs> Vivian, what is the worst moment during your first attempt at either writing or at writing, and how did you dust yourself off and keep going? I do. Um, we all have that horror story. <laughs> my first book, um, there was nobody that was waiting for it. It wasn't an assignment, um, and I kept getting sidetracked doing other things. Uh, but I finally wrote it, and. I thought this is good, it is funny, and yes, I am going to get this published. And I sent it out to 32 editors who said, not with us, you're not gonna get it published. <laughs> so my bit of advice for anybody who is interested in writing is to not let yourself become discouraged because it did finally get accepted with very, very few changes. There were changes like, okay, you said, she said, and both the queen and a princess are in a room. Do you mean, which one do you mean? You know, real easy changes, not like, 
Could you make the princess into a dog? <laughs> <laughs> So in the early days of your writing journey, what was the hardest part for you? <laughs> the early days of my writing career, I was uh, a stay-at-home mom with four boys under eight. So, uh, and a traveling husband who was usually an average of about a thousand miles away. So I would say the challenge, the hardest part was finding the time, like that is for, for all of us. But I became a nap time writer, but also I would um, put the boys to bed, and then I would, I usually wrote from about 9 uh, p.m. till about 1 in the morning. So I, and I'm still a, like a late afternoon or evening writer. Um, I don't get up at 5 o'clock, um, <laughs> if I can help. Um, I don't really have a, you know, I. I didn't have a, a, a fear of failure, um, and I have to say that I I had, had it pretty easy. The way I had my first essay published was because I was at a party in the wintertime, and there was a sports writer there that I knew really well. We were talking, and I had started writing a couple essays, and one was a reminiscence about Canandaigua Lake and being a little kid and um, you know peering through the dock things and looking at the fish and just what, what that was like for me. Um, and he said, oh, you should send it to Upstate because they're looking for summer uh, pieces. And this was February. It was freezing out. But um, I, that's what I did. And uh, typically, um, that was how I first got uh, was contacts that I knew. The rest of you, um, have you have you experienced a lot of fear of failure getting started in your writing journey? Is that a fear that you've carried with you, or have you felt confident and gotten through it? Thanks, Brooke. I had a moment of total panic when I was working on my first book, Amanda Steps Up, over there. Um, and had signed a contract with a publisher who really liked the manuscript, thought it was hopeful, and that we need more hope in the world, and I agree. But she assigned me an editor whom I've never met, and she really hated the book. Oh, no. oh my gosh. It's probably obvious from the title that Manda is a college student who's having trouble with her drinking. And she finally joins AA with the support of her boss, thank God, and starts working on sobriety and changing the way she thinks and acts and, and so on. Um, unfortunately, the editor hated Alcoholics Anonymous and was very active in the field of domestic abuse. And it happens that the book starts with um, Manda in her car having fled a situation that could certainly be called domestic violence. Um, so she wanted me to turn it into a book about domestic violence, and she was adamant about it. It was, oh, it was, it was painful. It was really painful. And at one point I stepped back and I thought, you know, of all of this criticism, there must be some nuggets of truth in there, and there probably are some things that I need to look at in the book and improve it. And that helped me to, to change my own attitude toward the situation. And it gave me courage to go back to the publisher and say, here's what I'm doing, here's why. Um, but I, I thought you liked the manuscript and you considered it a, a hopeful book. Um, I'm getting nowhere with this editor with the exception of the changes I've made it, made already. And fortunately, she stepped in. 
But I'll tell you, for I, I don't know how long, I was angry, I was upset, I was panicked, I just didn't know what to do. And it really took a long time to turn around. This was my first experience writing a book. And you know, I really grew from it. I really learned. But I had to step back and own my own part. Yes. Or Adams. Yes. Oh, fear. I feel like I should start singing when I get this in front of me. <laughs> I think the biggest fear for me was when I walked into my parents' house and saw my mother reading my book that has a love scene in it. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> You never know who's reading it. Right, because we've talked about the solitary nature of writing. So how do you individually, collectively, how much value do you find in writers or critique groups? And are there best practices for finding or starting a writing or critique group? So I think that, first of all, if you're thinking about being part of a writer's group, the first thing you have to do is let go of your preconceived notions that your baby is the most beautiful baby in the world. Because there are going to be people who are going to say to you, that is the ugliest baby I've ever seen. And they don't mean harm, they mean to, to help you make your peace better. Um, and I think that by the same token, when you're looking for people to be in a critique group with, you want people who aren't just going to say to you, that is the best thing I've ever read. That is awesome, even if it is, of course. But, uh, but you want them to be honest. You want them to be fair with what you've written. You want them to be kind, too. So keep that in mind. You don't want to go grab Joe Schmo off the street and ask him to, to start being a part of a critique group if you don't know what the personality is like. Um, and then also find out what they write, because it's tough if you're in a critique group and somebody is writing something that you absolutely do not want to read and cannot stand. So you want to be careful about that too. Dot, I love everything you write. <laughs> uh, I, I've been really blessed with two writers groups. The first one goes way back to the U of R. Um, they had a week-long writers conference and they would bring in editors and um, authors from New York. And um, among the uh, group's uh, fiction, I met uh, a couple of women. We had a great time that week talking, and we ended up um, forming, deciding to form a writer's group. And it boiled down really to three. Two women, in particular, that I think of as my creative mothers. And um, I, I totally agree with Lori. If, if you're in a writer's group, you want the, the criticism to be constructive, not somebody sitting there just to you know, destroy whatever you have to say. Um, the second group came many years later, and um, I saw Nazareth, Nazareth College was having um, a workshop led by Zena Collier. I don't know if anybody remembers her, but Zena was an author and wrote for the National, the National, I think it's called, magazine. Um, she lived in, uh, on Berkeley Street. And so, anyway, she, she had the um, workshop. We started out with eight people. I brought, actually, the, the beginnings of my book to that workshop. And um, over the eight weeks of the workshop, the last meeting that we had with Zena, there were two of us. One, <laughs> because everybody else dropped out. So, um, and as a matter of fact, one of them, one of that member that stick, stuck it out was um, a member now of Flair. But, um, so we, Zena said, you know, I could do this at home. We have to pay Nazareth for room fee. So, um, and that was uh, a, an excellent experience because I got Zena's notes, I still have them, 
And um, we, we had very, um, very positive, but very constructive. I mean, I can't believe the things that they would know or see in my writing. And I'd be like, really? <laughs> Thank you. For any of you who are interested in writing and don't belong to a critique group, you might think, why do I need a critique group? And the answer is because you have in your head your characters, your setting, your situation, whether it's supposed to be funny or whether it's supposed to be spooky or whether it's supposed to be romantic. And sometimes when you're first writing, that doesn't come across. Let me give one real quick example. I was writing something and I said that the girl was sitting on the couch looking through the book. And at the end of the story, one of the critique partners said, well, what about the girl with the x-ray eyes? Oh. <laughs> okay, that was not what I meant. It did not mean looking through the book, but obviously, if she was confused, other people would have been too. So it's better to have your friends critique you before you send it to an agent or an editor. And I can say for sure as an editor, I don't mince my words that well. <laughs> Thanks, Brooke. Um, I'd like to talk about both critique groups and contests. Both were extremely helpful to me. Um, when I was first writing, um, I belonged to the Lilac City Rochester Writers Group, who are still in existence and still doing a great job for writers of all kinds. Um, three months out of the 12 meetings were devoted strictly to critiques. And not everybody showed up at those meetings because if you were committed to a critique meeting, that meant you were submitting 2,500 words of your work in progress and posing some questions that would be helpful for the group to answer. Very nice way to frame it. But you were also committing to reading everyone else's and giving them feedback which turned out to be as useful for me and as important to me as the feedback I got because I could see how very, very talented the other's authors were regardless of whether they were writing in my genre or not, and most of them were not. Um, there was a tremendous variety of feedback coming from all sides. Um, so critique groups were really, really important to me and I took advantage of every one of those. Um, the other thing I did to get feedback was enter contests. I was a member of the Romance Writers for America and the national organization was divided into regional or local groups. Um, so Syracuse has a group, Albany has a group, Buffalo has a group. Um, the D.C. area has a group. Huge area in the West has a group, and so on. And pretty much every group has a contest that's open to anyone in um, Romance Writers of America. They all have different rules, they all have different fees, um, and they all handle feedback a little bit differently. And I was looking for the contests where you got written feedback from several authors. Um, and that was extremely valuable to me. These were people who were writing in my genre. I started with romance. Um, and they were people, by and large, who were published. And they weren't missing any words. It was very, very constructive, very, very helpful to me. And by the time the third book in the series came along, I actually got an award for one of the books, and I was really proud of that. And boy, did that motivate me. Um, so that was important for me, to improve the quality of my writing and to feel like an author.
to take this question and hand it to you, Nancy. So we've talked about writing in solitaire, but also there's this collaborative aspect to it. Is that true in art? Do you mean, is that true amongst artists, or can you elaborate on your question? Uh, or are you talking about the writer-artist collaboration? I'm wondering if you, if illustrators and artists collaborate with one another on projects or getting pieces completed. And maybe you don't, I have no idea. We don't collaborate, but we do have critiques. <laughs> Much like the writers okay. here. Yeah. Um, for example, I belong to the Rochester Art Club, which is professional um, fine artists. And every once in a while we get together and it's the what's on your easel night. And we all <laughs> take turns putting up our latest work in progress and stepping back and letting everyone take a crack at it and point out things that don't look right, noses that are crooked maybe, or <laughs> things like that. Because art is a, a, a visual language, right? Much as in a written text, in art you can have mistakes and problems too when you get into the artwork. So we do have critique sessions as well. Thank you, I have learned something interesting tonight, thank you. <laughs> I had a question for everyone. How do you keep yourself motivated during the hard phase? Marcy, I'm up at five. <laughs> so the sunrise motivates me many, many mornings, which means I need a cup of espresso to go with the sunrise. Um, but in terms of hard times, how do I stay motivated? Um, I would say that to for me in writing my memoir, many times it came very easily, but there were many stories that were hard to tell. And so what motivated me was just the desire to tell it in a way that others could be living it with me. So what often helped me when I got stuck or I got to a part that was very difficult, I would take a walk, I would go outside, I would go near a flip and listen to, me, to the water. And then as I was walking, I would kind of mull through how could I, I could tell it better, what would be the details, and sometimes I literally would run home so I could get to the computer and recapture what I had thought. Whereas before, I was stuck at the computer and couldn't think. So moving my body, giving myself space and time to kind of allow myself to be in it helped me through the difficult stories. I kind of jump on what you said, Lori, because if I get stuck in need motivation, a lot of times I'll take a notebook and I'll go out in the fresh air again, and I'll just sit and I'll start writing whatever comes into my mind. And um, I might doodle or whatever, and it's amazing how that starts freeing me up. And another little piece of advice to go along with this is, I don't know if you've ever heard of, I'm not swearing when I say this, bitchock. Anybody heard of that? Butt in chair, hands on keyboard. <laughs> You're not going to get anything written if you don't get in front of the computer. And even if you sit and write nonsense or uh, write what happened to your day or whatever, it's still putting something down. So I highly recommend that. That's another advantage of a critique group um, if you have regular meetings, you don't want to be the one who's showing up week after week without a new project. Um, but I, if, if I'm stuck, I read. And it's not that I'm copying or thinking, oh, I, I'm, I'm going to use the same plot that this author did. But by reading a good book, it reminds me why I want you to become a writer. Uh, I have, <clears throat> when I was writing um, my novel, What You Don't Know Now, it's over there, um, for several years, my main character was uh, snorkeling in the Aegean. So she was underwater for quite a while. <laughs> and I felt that it was time to bring her back to the surface. But at the same time, um, my mom was very ill, and we ended up putting her in um, care hospital, long-term care hospital. 
and that was a night, a 16 month nightmare. Um, so I would be there about four times a week. I was also working on my own in my um, copywriting and marketing job. And so when I got home at night, I would go into the computer and I would dive into this world that I was creating. I wanted to be there and I wanted to be, I began to love the characters so much that I just wanted to go and be with them for a while. And that was a real break from what was really going on in my real life. Um, and I also agree that uh, I walk my dog a lot. <laughs> and you know, probably three or four times a day. When I say walk, I mean walk on a leash. And um, that really that really does clear your head. Get getting outside in all weather because of, you know I, it doesn't matter if it's uh, springtime in Canada or it's you know 60 degree winds and or 60 degree mile an hour winds and you know 10 degrees. Um, but just being out there and being present I think is important. I'm going to jump slightly in my question. So we're moving actually to a section on craft. We've been talking about motivation, how we stay motivated as writers, and how we get reinforcement or reflection from other writers. But I want to talk a little bit about craft. I want to go back to your, what was that acronym? Big job. Your big yeah. job. So here's my question for you. It sounds good in theory, but what if that's not what you Wow, she didn't warn me about this question. <laughs> Not fair. All right, so if that's not working, uh, I totally agree with Vivian. I will pick up a favorite book and I'll read a favorite passage from it. And then I'll sit there thinking, I want to do that too. So that definitely is something that will get me going. I picked this up at an online writing group that I was in during the pandemic. And we were, many, many thousands of people were in it. We connected online via Zoom. And one of the things that I took from that helps me keep um, topics for my blog is I have a glass jar on my desk and I have different slips of paper in it. And they might say, that day I was da, da, da. Um, I love da, da, da. Or um, you know, just sentence starters. And so if I'm really stuck, even though it may not specifically be for the book, but for my blog, or I just want to write that day, I try and write every day, um, and I don't know what to write about, I pick a slip up, and I give myself five minutes, and I start writing. And usually, something will come of it that will become a blog post that I never imagined that I was going to write about, or you, know, you just have to, I think Anne Lamar, who's one of my favorite writers who writes about writing. She has a lovely book called Bird by Bird, I think it is. And in it, she talks about drip by drip by drip. That's how you write. I want to add to that since you caught me off guard. Um, I just finished teaching a creative writing, uh, creative writing class at CUCA. And one of the things that I discovered from my students was they loved it when we did the flash fiction. That's, I made that up. And it was very much what Laura was talking about. Find a scenario and just spend 10 minutes writing about it. And it doesn't have to be anything that you take further, but they found that when they wrote the flash fiction, that it got the creative juices going. And a lot of them took those little stories and used them in some way. So a quick flash fiction will help. Thanks. Um, I, there are two types of writers, I hear this all the time, plotters and pantsers. And plotters really know what this book is about from the start, and they know where it's going, and they know how it's gonna get there. They've got a detailed outline that they follow. I'm not a plotter, I'm a pantser. Um, and I tend to pay attention to really important scenes in the story, and I don't necessarily write them in order. So if I'm really bogged down with something, rather than throw the whole book out or uh, beat my head against the wall or whatever, I might start in with another scene that really appeals to me. 
and get going on it. What I find is that even if a scene is going badly, I learn from whatever I put down. I may need to go back and re-examine a character. I may realize I'm missing a character. Um, there are so many things I've learned from writing it badly. So I go right ahead and write it badly, knowing that it's going to turn into something useful. That's it. All right, a question for everyone, one very short answer. So other than your computer and keyboard, or perhaps Nancy, your easel and paintbrushes, what is the one absolutely essential thing that you need to write? Um, this may sound weird, but it's actually a person. Um, and it's not a person who's actively in my life anymore. He passed away um, a year ago. Um, but he's the one who got me started writing. And there was something about having brunch on the porch at Belger's Castle when my friend John turned on me um, that got me to see I didn't have to wait till retirement to write. I could find in my very, very, very busy life at least one hour a day to write, and I committed to that. So one hour a day, I wrote. And honest to God, within one year, I had a book and a contract for its publication. It was amazing to me that I could do that in one hour. So that memory of John and his inspiration he passed away, of course, um, a couple of years ago. He just made it to 100. <laughs> and just the memory of John, I have a picture of him around and a couple of other things. Um, it just reminds me, just an hour a day, keep going, keep going, keep going. So, 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 so other than your computer and a chair, what's the one essential? I guess it would be the willingness to share something. Two things. Chopin's Nocturnes, absolutely. As soon as I turn those on, and a Yankee Candle Blueberry Candle. <laughs> it works. It works. Two essentials, number one, chocolate. <laughs> number two, remembering that first story that got rejected 32 times. A big glass of ice water with lots of ice or a Diet Coke with lots of ice. The ice is essential to me. <laughs> right, so the next one that we have you have to write yeah. back down your first well, when I first started writing, <laughs> there's no computer to write on. Uh, so that was, I definitely would write uh, handwritten uh, first drafts and then type them. Uh, but now, uh, uh, gradually, and I thought I'd never be able to do it any other way, but uh, gradually I moved into actually writing right into the computer. So, yeah. Ditto to what Marcy said, um, starting out, I was, I was writing everything longhand. There are still times that if I am not home and I'm getting an idea, or if I'm not by the computer and getting an idea, I write it out. But I have to say, I am such a sloppy handwriter. <laughs> <laughs> Can you tell what that is? Yeah. Thank you. That's on paper. <laughs> I don't really use the computer uh, other than for scanning and emailing files. Computer. Computer and occasionally the back of an envelope or a oh, napkin. <laughs> Computer. So a number of you have published children's books. I want to talk a little bit about the relationship between the author and the illustrator. So Nancy, most of these questions are for you. Um, 
So you work with both picture books and with young adult novels, correct? Um, how does the illustration process vary between the two? Oh, okay. So most of my work has been with traditional publishers, which means I'm dealing with the editor usually, right? I'm not dealing with the authors ever in traditional publishing. The the editor is the go-between. She wants to keep us apart, so we don't get in trouble. <laughs> Actually, they really want to kind of protect the illustrator from any undue influence from the author, because authors have a very clear picture in their mind of their stories naturally. Of course, it's coming from inside them, but the illustrators have their own art form, and the publisher's paying the bill, so. The um, picture books are a much longer, more drawn out process, usually over anywhere from four to 11 or 12 months of a lot of back and forth. I'm a very detailed illustrator, so it takes me a long time. <clears throat> um, and the only one time I have ever worked with an author doing a picture book was my most recent book, which is a very unusual situation because it was a, a um, natural history book and we wanted the input of the author to get all the scientific details correct. So he got to see all my sketches right from the get-go. He was great. So fortunately that worked out well. But mostly it's it's just me working with the, with the editor or publisher on the sketches, um, submitting them, getting feedback, submitting more detailed sketches with revisions, getting feedback. And once those are approved, finally going on to the final art and um, hopefully not doing any revisions on the final art, but it does happen. Um, with the YA book, it's just much sh faster because I'm just doing the cover in color and sometimes a few little black and white spots on the inside. So like that could probably be done in a month. Okay. Do you work with self-published authors at all, or are you strictly? I do. I have done. I have done three books with self-published authors. One here in Canada, Miss Sally Crozier. I did her. Well, it was a book cover for her. But I've done. Um, I have them over there if anyone wants to look at them. A um, couple more. Uh, one through my agent, and then two just directly with authors. And How does the working process differ? I'm working with someone who really doesn't know the industry too well as far as publishing sometimes. Sometimes they're like, I have to educate them sometimes. And sometimes they're very opinionated on what they want and they're the one paying me so I typically give them what they want, right? right. And, it, and it's a flat fee, I'm not, you know, I'm not going into business for them, right? So they're gonna pay me a flat fee, so I'm gonna give them what they want. And um, any other questions about that? I mean, it's, it's a little, um, I really try to get to know the author first because there's a lot of, you never know, you want someone who's professional and kind of knows a little bit so that you can work well together, right? style is because if they're writing a goofy book they don't want my art to go with it <laughs> you know my art's very kind of more involved in a little more serious looking so I would like them to ask me how much I charge for things I will tell them you know because I don't want to spend a lot of time with them and then find out that they can't afford me right because my time is precious just like theirs is um, and I don't want to give them an entire course in how to illustrate a book. You know, I'll give them tips, but I'm not gonna hold their hand through the whole process. You know? I, I really try to pay it forward, but um, there's a lot of free information out on the internet, and I often give them all those links to go to to learn about 
illustration and finding an illustrator and stuff. So I, I do try to help them. I didn't, it didn't sound very good. <laughs> I get a lot of calls like that. You know. So for Vivian and Lori, you both published children's books, illustrated children's books. For each of you, so you were self-published, you're traditionally published. So tell us about your experience working with illustrators. I usually don't work with the illustrator, I work with the editor. Um, a lot of my books have just the cover illustration because they're for slightly older, or as you said, with the spot illustrations, maybe uh, for each chapter or right. each, each uh, story, if it's a collection of, of stories. Um, and I am getting the artwork, usually when it's pretty much finished. Um, and even in the case of something that, said, okay, this doesn't really reflect what happened in the story or how the character was dressed in the story. And the editor said, can you change how she's dressed? <laughs> so yeah, I, I, I had to change the description of what she was doing. Or say, it's fine the way it is. Really? Yeah, uh, because they weren't gonna ask the illustrator to change. Yeah. Um, oh, this is yours, I typed words. <laughs> <laughs> that day she wore a white shroud-like Outfit. <laughs> um, I have to say, I have mostly been very, very well pleased with how the illustrations have come out because I am not a visual person. I can do a smiley face. I think you can see the kind of smiley face that I can do. Um, so yeah, we are putting me in charge of dictating what should go on the cover, and a lot of times the illustrator comes up with incredible things that never cross my mind, but once I see it, I say, absolutely. Except for that white shroud like that. <laughs> so of course, my experience is very different because mine are self-published, and I work directly with the illustrator. I started with the illustrator that I'm using. She was a field period student at Cuca College, and she illustrated Paw Prints in the Snow, which is a middle grades novel. So that was a whole different kind of drawing than when I decided that I was going to um, immortalize my grand dog in a, a book called Chance's Lucky Day. And so I said to her, I'm looking for a particular kind of style. I wanted a digital look to my uh, illustrations. And she gave me some samples of what she could do and then what we do is, I write the story, then we meet, we go over the story, and we talk about what we think should be in the illustrations. And just like Vivian said, I, I, don't, I can draw smiley faces, I can draw a better smiley face than that, though. I'm telling you. But, um, but I'm not, I'm also not an artist and illustrator, and I defer to her, because she'll, there'll be little intricacies that she'll think of that, um, haven't even entered my mind. So um, it's it's a lot of back and forth with us, and um, I, I think that she does a great job. She really is coming along with that. All right, this question is for Lori, Lori, and Marcy, because you all have experience writing for magazines and journals. How is that process different, and what is the first step that a writer should take if they're looking to engage in that market? Have a client. <laughs> Helps. I did a lot of work through companies. So I worked with a lot of technology companies. I ghost wrote stories for CEOs and executives who wanted to get in Fortune magazine but didn't have the time to write it. Um, I did speech writing, like all different things. So um, it helped for me. I was like a consultant, so I would be hired to highlight a particular product or a particular thing. We would have a target publication. We would reach out, I would reach out to the publication. Um, most of the time, I wouldn't start the clock ticking and start writing until I had the story placed. But you can do it the other way. If you're a freelance writer, you have a great idea for a story, you can either write a first draft and see, you know, especially if you have a relationship with the publication. 
um, and I'm sure Marcy can talk to this, because once you develop a relationship, sometimes they'll come to you and say, I have this story, would you be willing to write it? So it really runs the gamut, but it's a great way of getting your writing published, um, because magazines, online magazines, they all need content. The problem is you may not get through very much. Anyone here know uh, Country Magazine, Country Extra, Farm and Ranch? Do you recognize those magazines? I've had multiple articles published with them, and the thing that I learned was that you need to figure out what the audience is for, or who the audience is for those magazines that you want to write for, because um, you don't want to write a, a horror story for someone who's looking for life on the farm type stories. And I was very successful with them because I figured out what they were looking for and what kind of audience they had. And um, I, I only had one story rejected in all those years because it's almost like playing a game. It was kind of fun because I'd, I'd analyze and figure out what kind of story would work well right now. And I was usually pretty spot on. So write what you read, too, I think. Um. Well, I told you about uh, my conversation with a sports writer, and, and I did um, submit to Upstate Magazine, and I will never forget the day that I got, in the, at this time, a uh, letter in the mail with a check. <laughs> and said, we loved what you have. Do you have any more? So that's really kind of like a bolt from heaven. And I said, do I have any more? And so I began writing essays and, um, and humor. And I, so the key with all of my experience in writing for magazines is working with the editor, uh, knowing what they want. I was, I've been very, very lucky not to have to pitch very much. Um, the next thing that happened, another miraculous thing, and this is way back, um, I was reading uh, golf magazine. Now I don't, I don't play golf. I don't know. Well, I know some things about golf, but I, at the time I was married to a tour player. So uh, I read this article that this man, is a very well-known golf writer from Britain, had written about something I can't even remember, but I took, I took uh, exception to. So I wrote him a letter, and I said, you don't know what you're talking about. And I went on to explain to him why he didn't know what he was talking, what he was writing about. So I got a letter back from him, and he said, if you think you can do better, you go ahead and write the article. <laughs> so I pitched the, uh, one of the editors um, of Golf Magazine. I still remember his name, his name was Dwayne Nutland. And uh, one day, I was laying on my bed with one of my sick boys, and uh, the phone rang, and it was Dwayne Nutland. And he said, we love your letter. We would love you to write this article. I mean, it was like, <laughs> and I said, yes, not having any idea how I was going to do it. but. Um, it was, so he wanted to know, he wanted me to write, basically what I knew, which was life with a tour for the wives and the children. And so I ended up interviewing about 13 different players or their wives. Um, and, it, and they put it into a uh, little spread. And they gave me 11 pages. <laughs> um, another big magazine, uh, that I ended up writing for was Success Magazine. And, um, and that came from a writer that I knew in New York City who um, wasn't gonna do, they wanted him to do the article and he didn't have time. He said, but I know a great person that can do it. And that's Marcy Deals, who lived in Rochester. And I ended up interviewing uh, Jack Nicklaus for a cover story. But it always comes down to the editor and knowing when you, if you want to write for a magazine, of course now a lot of it is online, but you want to look at whatever suffices as their masthead. 
and look at who the editors are and um, pitch to that particular editor. Usually, and it's like associate editor um, would be more, more likely than the, um, the, the, the big cheese. Because uh, they're very busy. <laughs> All right, so we'll talk a little bit about what I call the second most intimidating part of becoming an author, which is the publishing process. Uh, in the language of publishing, there are two primary ways of getting into print. One is a self slash independent publishing, and the second is uh, traditional publishing. Traditional publishing is when your book is purchased by a publishing house, such as Simon & Schuster or Hachette. And self-publishing is when the author undergoes the full process of bringing that book from idea to actually printed copy themselves. So when an author is traditionally published, the publishing house manages that production process, including the editing, the cover art, and the physical creation of the book. A publishing house may also participate in marketing and promotion. So while traditional publishing takes much of the stress out of the process, because heaven knows writers were stressed enough getting there in the first place, uh, authors often chafe at losing some of the creative control over their work. Editing and cover designs are two examples of places where authors lose control over the work. And we've heard examples from our panelists of losing control of editing and design work. So when an author chooses to self-publish, they retain full creative control over their own work. However, they do bear the responsibility for editing, formatting, cover art, publication, figuring out how to get that ISBN number on there, um, and quality control, so it's a trade-off. So with that as a general understanding panel, tell me about your first publishing experience in five sentences or less. <laughs> <laughs> My, um, with my book, the first publishing experience I had was with a, um, a guy I knew here in Canandaigua who also was writing his uh, mystery novels. And I, I, wanna, I wanna go back a little bit. I pitched about, um, or queried, about 85 agents when I first started. So, you know, I went for the traditional, I, you know, I got requests for a full manuscript. I got some for good f uh, first 50 pages. So I, I came close, but no cigar on that end. Um, some encouraging things. It's a slow process. Uh, I, I did one at a time, which, you know, some people want to do, you know, 50 editors. Or I'm sorry, 50 agents at a time. But I um, again, it's always it's always a building relationship. So um, finally, I thought, you know, if I wait to get an agent, this is never going. It could take God knows how long. So um, we we talked about self-publishing uh, the book and um, created merge publishing. And um, so my book was the launch for it. And um, we called it a hybrid publisher because we had a team for every author. You had the publisher, you had the editor. So I had a great editor, and it was just someone that, uh, her name is Cynthia Kalko, and she's in Rochester. Uh, she's wonderful. Um, the cover designer, and what is the last one that we made? Pretty much that's it. Anyway, the idea was if the book was successful, um, each one would get a percentage of the, um, the book sales. And so, you know, it really put the, it, it, but the publisher and the, and the author would get the largest percentage. Um, so that was my experience. It's, yeah. We just created your own publishing company. We, we created yeah, our own publishing company. Publishing company. <laughs> and now I know so much more about it. So ISBN numbers and, and uh, Library of Congress and all that kind of thing. Yeah. It can be done. <laughs> I started writing um, seriously. I mean, with the hope of getting published. 
when my daughter was born, which was in 1979. So that was pre-home computers. Um, so I had to type my manuscript out and send it to one publisher at a time because otherwise I would have had to have typed the manuscript out twice because I'm obviously not gonna send a carbon copy to, to an editor. And so it would come back to me and some of the pages might be a little bit crumpled and I would have to redo them. And as I was retyping them, I was still, my ego is so big. I would say, this is funny, this is good, this needs to get published. Uh, so, so that's why I didn't give up. But things were moving along a lot faster then because each publishing house was getting w one copy and, and uh, authors were not able to send multiple copies to different editors. Um, so it took two years to get 32 rejections. That is an incredibly short time. Now it can take two years for me to get an acceptance from a publisher that I've worked with oh, before. Wow. Things have really slowed down because of computers. Computers have made lots of things easier, but they slowed down the process. So two years to get um, an editor to say yes to the story, and they said, we have an illustrator in mind to do the cover and a picture with each chapter, and that was Trina Shark Hyman. She had just won the Comic Con <laughs> for the best illustrations in a children's book. She had just won that. Um, so people would recognize her style of drawing, and they would buy my book because they recognized her style. So it, it really helped me. <laughs> um, okay, I'll try to make this short. I had two kids. My husband was gone the whole time. I was living in Dallas and had was working as an illustrator, but not in picture books, which is what I wanted to be doing. I was illustrating Sunday school stories and educational books for little kids. Um, doing a lot of that, but I really wanted to break into children's book publishing. Very high competition to this day to get published traditionally in children's books as an illustrator. But I thought I'd try and I thought, I'm just gonna write my own book and illustrate it. Well, writing's a whole other craft. <laughs> and I didn't really have time to become a great writer and <laughs> great illustrator, so my, I had a story idea and I asked my sister to write it and she was actually a very good writer so she wrote the story and I illustrated it so we collaborated and I'm thinking well, this is going to be easy. <laughs> I started sending it around with the slides, you know this was in the late 80s, long time ago, no computers, although I think by then you could submit to more than one publisher, like it was a big breakthrough to be able to send to them. Yeah, Xerox copies, but you could send to maybe three or four publishers. It was acceptable. So I started doing that. I got, I don't know, so many rejections from everybody. Nobody wanted to publish my book. But I did join a wonderful organization called the Society of Children, Book Writers, and Illustrators. If you're interested in writing or illustrating for children, I highly recommend you join this organization. It's a professional organization for all different levels, and that's how you learn about the industry. That's how I learned. I went to all their conferences, both locally here in Western New York State and in New York. New York. Well, I took my little book. I had made a book dummy, which is like a fake book with color photographs pasted in and the words printed out on my book. <coughs> glued together to look like a book. And there was a speaker there from a small publishing house that published stories about animals that got into trouble and people who rescued them or something. I mean, this was what my book was about. So right after she spoke, I went up to her with my little dummy and I said, take a look. And she took a look and, and we published it together. So that's a story of 
putting yourself out there, going to professional groups and organizations, being brave, being ready with something presentable, and, and things will happen for you if you put yourself out there. So that was my first foot in the door. So my first foot in the door with novels was with Finding Atticus, and I was teaching middle school English at the time, and my students said to me, Mrs. Adams, could you please write us a book where the people don't die, the animals don't die, and all of these <laughs> horrible things happen. So um, I did. I, I, I wrote that book for them, and we actually used it in class, unpublished. And I had planned to send it for traditional, to see if I could get it traditionally published. And um, the students all wanted copies of it, so I had it self-published just so they could get copies. Well, the book grew legs, and all of a sudden I had a following. And so then when I wrote the next book, I discovered I had more of a following. So I have made the conscious decision to self-publish because I, I've created this, this marketing that uh, is working for me. Uh, am I going to be rich? Probably not, maybe someday. But it's working for me, so I have purposely done that. My first experience with publishing was self-publishing, and I actually have a few copies of the book here. It's an anthology. I joined a online writers community during the pandemic. It connected thousands of writers, and we would write together on Zoom. We would support each other. We would submit our writing on an online platform and ask people for feedback. And there was about six or eight women that we kind of found ourselves during the several years of the pandemic commenting, commenting on each other's work. Many, many of us, myself included, had never been published. We just wanted to publish. So I and another one of the women, I'd never met them in person, I emailed her and I said, Susan, let's publish an anthology. All these women deserve to be published, including ourselves. In four months, we published a book. It's called Badass Sisterhood. We called ourselves Badass Sisters online. And um, we edited it, but we didn't heavily edit it. So we asked people to submit their best work. We hired an editor. Um, one of the women was an artist in Germany. She did the cover art. Um, I learned myself how to do cover art, how to lay it out. Um, we applied for the ISBN number. We formatted it. Susan and I had never met each other. She lived in Montana, and she came to Canandaigua with her family for a week of vacation last summer. And we spent the entire week working out the book. Um, I had two experiences, one traditional and one self-publishing. Um, my first book was traditionally published, and I mentioned that I had written it one hour a day, um, and within a year had a contract for a book. The way I got that contract was two parts. One, I went with um, my cousin, who's a published author, to a conference in Maine and pitched to a very, very prominent agent. And no, she didn't buy it. <laughs> but she told me a lot that was really helpful to me in revising the book before I was ready to pitch to somebody else. And then I lucked out. This is pure luck. The writers group I talked about in Rochester that year put on a big conference and a publisher came and took pitches herself. And she's the one I pitched to. And she's the one who liked the book and thought it sounded hopeful. So I sent the manuscript to her immediately. She wanted the full manuscript and she offered me a contract for it. Pure luck. Um, the self-publishing came about because I started writing uh, mystery, which is my favorite, favorite genre in the whole world, and knew that I needed really strong editing um, help. And I wasn't getting that with my traditional publisher. It was a small publisher, and small publishers can't afford a lot of services that the big 10, big six, what is it, big five um, publisher would, would offer, like editing. Um, 
Um, and I knew I needed that. I also knew that I needed a cover artist and found one through another author who was very, very easy to deal with for newbies like me. And that turned out to be a wonderful collaboration. Um, so I, I undertook the publishing process, self-publishing, and because I had worked half the time of my career in high tech and half the time in higher education, um, I was very comfortable with the technology of self-publishing. Um, my editor turned out to be somebody in Hawaii, and my book artist is somewhere in Michigan. <laughs> I've never met them face to face. I'm not entirely clear what they look like. Um, but it was a good collaboration. And that's my story. Wonderful. All right, because we're about out of time, I am going to eliminate the last category of questions. But I will say that the most terrifying thing for any author is not the publication process, but marketing. How do you market your work, right? Um, I'm going to hand the microphone down. Tell us the one thing that's worked well for you in marketing, and then I'm going to open the floor to questions. Surprisingly, it's face to face contact with buyers, direct sale. Um, I haven't marketed my book yet because it's not out, um, but in terms of my blog, um, it's very hard to get the attention of people, and my advice would be read other people's blogs, comment on theirs, and they'll read yours. And don't be a pest about your blog. I, I post not very often, and I have, you know, I use Substack, which makes it very easy to send an email out when I post to people who subscribe by themselves. And so um, they get an email that notifies that I've written something new, and then they check it out, and many of the people who've read my blog and have subscribed are friends, but then also they tell their other friends. So um, the two advices have a lot of friends that will subscribe, but also um, read other people's work, because when you read theirs and you comment on theirs, then they will read yours. Facebook. <laughs> Successful. Um, also on Instagram, those are the two social platforms. I'm not, I'm not very good at posting a lot, but that's probably the best thing. I am terrible at marketing, and um, because there is a marketing department at traditional publishers, I pretty much said, yeah, you guys know what you're doing, and then I could complain. You're not getting my name out. <laughs> <laughs> my own fault. I made a mistake uh, early on um, after the initial, you know, flurry of having a launch party and um, going to different events and, and selling books, which, yeah, I, to, to be honest, I would sell an average of about six books, uh, no matter where I was. It just seemed, six seemed to be the, the number, but um, gradually, uh, the mistake was that I didn't continue to market my book because I thought, well, it's, you know, it's getting old or whatever. Um, but I do use social media. And I, uh, I personally love Twitter. It's not the best, really, to sell books. But what I like about it is the community of writers. There are agents on there. Um, so they get to know you as a person. I don't, I, I don't post or, or, or tweet a lot about, you know, here's my book. A lot of authors and self-published authors do. And um, I look at their books and, you know, I think, good luck. Um, because some of them, the covers on them are horrendous. But anyway, um, so I do have, I, I have a uh, Pinterest account. And I have, um, and I have, of course, Facebook. So on Facebook, I have two profiles. I have my personal, and then I have uh, Marcy Deal Books. 
Um, and Instagram has become a problem because I started an account for um, a client, and unfortunately, they had they still have me as the um, the author. So whenever I go into Instagram, they they send me to that page. So I can't get into my own page. I haven't figured this out yet. Somebody <laughs> with the client needs to go in and just wipe me out of here. But um, yeah, marketing is is a constant thing. And it's not fun. <laughs> no. I get to have a single one of my authors say, you know what I love? Marketing. <laughs> no. So what kind of questions do you have for our authors today? So in the course of this, I really enjoyed the sense of humor you've all displayed. And I'm wondering, for those of you, as not writing a, a book that's supposed to be funny all the way through, but how do you introduce and manage the humor in the, um, in the course of the story and, and have it fit? Good question. I try and use humor where it's appropriate and sometimes to release tension. And so in my writing, my style is I use a lot of um, cadence of sentences where I might say something that I think could be funny and just leave like a three word sentence as a paragraph on its own so that the humor gets kind of breaks up the story. It's kind of like if you're a comic, you say the punchline and you wait. So I type it in and I just give space. And hopefully people find what I've written humorous. I don't know because I'm not there when they read it. <laughs> um, my middle grade stories are, are very often told from first person, um, a 12, 13 year old girl. And 12 and 13 year old girls tend to be pretty sarcastic. So, so the humor comes pretty obviously from that. Uh, I also have younger books that are told from the point of view of a squirrel. And the squirrel thinks that everybody loves squirrels because you know they, they put out seeds for them and, and they have all these, these apparatus around the seeds um, that spin around and that bounce them, and, and they're not realizing, no, those are bird feeders, and, and that apparatus is to keep you out of there. The squirrel does have a very squirrel-centric um, view of the world, and, and that's where the humor comes from. Uh, well, I used to write humor, and um, that was kind of an exaggeration of very, very normal things. Um, but I think that uh, the humor in my novel and the one that I'm writing right now comes it somehow comes out of the characters. Um, when the characters become real to you as you're writing, uh, and it happens where they start speaking on their own. I mean, you know, I don't need <laughs> I don't need an education or anything like that. Uh, but. Um, they become so real when you're writing that a lot of times they'll surprise you with what you have to say. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, everybody. This has been great. Um, I'm just wondering how you go about throwing a launch party. My book is almost ready, and I have no idea what that's all about or how to do it. Um, so, I don't know that there's any one right way to do it. Um, the way I do it is I prepare my readers well in advance by um, picking their interest and um, I put my excitement out there before I even have launch parties. So, I'm starting usually a month before. I'll put a little tease out, then I'll leave it. And then a couple weeks before, I'll put another tease out there. And then they start getting more frequent. And of course, the fervor builds. <laughs> but um, by the time we get to the launch party, um, we then, we have an actual, they 
it's like they're coming to a party because we reveal, at least for mine, I reveal the cover. Uh, we share some of the reading from it. The people can ask questions of me or if it's uh, Nisa, my illustrator, and me, they can ask questions of both of us. But, um, and we, give, we do giveaways. I give away books and things like that. So um, it's really, in my opinion, you don't do a, oh, tomorrow I'm gonna do a lunch party, everybody come. You start way back. And, and to be honest with you, actually, um, the next book in the Chance series is Chance Explores the Beach. I've already started putting little seeds out there for people to be looking for it. So um, the more lead time you can give without banging them over the head with it, I think the better. We, we when I did the anthology, we were all in different states. One woman was in a different country. It was during the pandemic. And so we did a Zoom launch party. Yeah. And everyone had their family and friends come. And we all ordered the book. We, we didn't have our, our book is not on, um, on Amazon. We chose a publisher publishing system called Blurb because it was the least expensive. And so all the authors in the book ordered their boxes, but we promised not to open them until the Zoom meeting. And we all opened them, and we each read a piece, and it was just really, really exciting and great fun. I just want to say that this was all on Zoom that I'm talking about. I've never done anything in person. I did have one in-person launch party, and it was a big success. I really enjoyed it. Um, the blue book over there, Planted, those are my high school colors. And um, it, that book came out in, in concert with my 50th high school reunion. And I took a deep breath and I contacted the folks who were in charge of the reunion activities and said, I'd really like to do this at the library in my hometown. And we did. And it was just a, a great time. Quite a few classmates came, folks I hadn't seen in a long time, and quite a few people bought the book. Further questions that you have? I don't need a microphone, I don't. Can you hear me right now? Yeah. 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 I, I have trouble hearing the microphone. It sounds a lot of blurry or something. Yeah. Um, in terms of marketing, one question that's come up for us my husband and I have a book we're about to publish it if we get past the IT part of it. And um, But I often find myself reading reciting poems, it's portraits and poems. I find myself reciting the poems a lot just because I love to. People love them, they respond. But I feel like I'm, I, I have a question about it. It's one called beefing out your content um, versus saving it for when you publish. And I have sort of a conflict about that, and I wonder if anybody has a, any thoughts about it. Um, it. It's a little bit maybe over self-confident to think um, if I tell people they'll use it, publish it, and in the days of social media, anybody can take anything and write anything. And I'd hate to see bits and pieces of this, to me a treasure, being you know kind of popping up here and there with no, no uh, credit to a, a song. So I don't know if any of you have ever had problems with that or any of you, but I'm not quite sure how to handle that issue. I just compulsively just share it. So. Sorry, Lori. Um, that is a very common fear with, uh, with writers, that someone is out there is going to steal their story or, um, and so some people are very, they're very uh, leery of um, actually sharing their <coughs> book or you know, trying to go with an agent uh, because they have this feeling that that's gonna get taken. And it, um, it's, I would say, extremely rare that that would ever happen. Um, but you're, you're right, you know, with social media, um, you want, your book to be already published. Yeah, and then you start. And then you start, yeah. And then you start sharing sharing it or where they can buy it or things like that. But at the same time, I found that if 
by talking about it by share. These poems that he writes are short and powerful. And I find that the compulsion to share them and to see the response is so well, that's it's yeah, great. I know. And we all want to see the response. But a lot of people but, grab a pen. I'll share one right now. It's two lines, and people buy, grab pens, open it, write that down. Mm -hmm. And it's just the two the couplet at the beginning of the book says it's called life. It says life is sorrowful, silly and sublime, not by turns, but at the same time. I have meditated on that forever. Mm -hmm. People write it down. You gotta stop but, sharing. <laughs> <laughs> but I have to publish it though. Yes, we tell you publish it. Yeah. Martha, can I give you a couple of seconds? This has nothing to do with your question. This is more, please make sure that you visit the author's tables before you go. Um, because we brought them here and we want to make sure that they have an opportunity to talk with you as well. And you can ask any of them questions as well. For example, the humor question, go and talk to Doc. <laughs> Absolutely. So um, I just wanted to throw that out there because um, you've been a fantastic audience. Yes. I have one more quick question. Uh, are any of you supporting your self-publishing or are you comment on that. Um, it's, this is almost like any other vocational type thing. The, the people that make the money are the editors and the book designers because they're getting paid to do this and they're paid up front you know, and you have to go out and sell this stuff. You know, so you know, you're not going to make any money. <laughs> and I just want to make another comment when we talk about self-publishing. That's really a misnomer because you have to, we did mention you have to have a team and you've got to hire an editor, you've got to hire a, a book designer and I have found you have to hire a proofreader. So unless you're serious enough to put some, you know, skin in the game, you know, you're not going to produce something of, of quality enough, you know, to to be proud of and, and to match what else is out there. Thank you for that. Have you heard that J.K. Rowling is richer than the Queen? Yeah. Uh, no. Richer than but, the Queen? Yeah. Richer than the Queen. Well, yeah. the Queen's not that. Richer than the Queen was. But that was said because it was so unusual. Yeah. Most writers are nowhere near as rich as the Queen's footman, I don't think. Uh, you do it because you love doing it, and I can't imagine not doing it. There was a, a period of time that I could have supported myself um, when I was publishing, traditionally, two books a year and doing a lot of school visits. As I got older and my energy started to wane, the income started going. And just to be fair, if you're if, if you want to make a living publishing your own work, there are ways that independent authors do it, but it, it involves rapid releases, it involves constant, constant marketing and more releasing, and so it's a never ending cycle. So any other question for our wonderful panel? It's just I got it in my thing. It's just a yes no question. Um, and only yes no. Uh, <laughs> Are you concerned about AI and how that might affect um, <laughs> the, uh, the field of writing that's available that could be your competition? It's not a yes no answer. Yeah. <laughs> um, right now, no. 
I have to agree with that. Right now, no. It, it just seems like, you know, they, they, they said if, if, if you had an infinite number of monkeys and an infinite number of, of uh, typewriters, um, they could create recreate the works of Shakespeare, but yeah, uh, we don't have the infinite number of monkeys and <laughs> we aren't willing to smudge through what they're putting out. questions. Again, please visit all of our authors, ask questions.